Hi everyone and welcome back. This next lecture is going to continue talking about the vocal tract and we're going to move into the second major feature of consonant sounds of language which is place. So at the end of the last lecture we talked about the vocal tract very briefly and that everything that's above the larynx, above the vocal folds, is known as the superlaryngeal or supraglottal um, vocal tract. You'll typically just hear me refer to this as the vocal tract as it's a little bit easier to understand that way. And this contains most of what we use when we're making different speech sounds. So all of the areas in our oral tract, all of the areas in our um, nasal cavity are different areas that we're using to make and manipulate in order to get those different sounds of language. And the different places that are located within that, those different anatomical places, is what we use to describe the place of articulation for a particular sound. And we use place of articulation. Articulation is how we're actually making that sound. So if we go back to that little linguist drawing of the vocal tract, we can see all of those different little spots that are labeled on this tract. So starting with the left, um, the lips, the teeth, the alveolar ridge, the hard palate, the velum, the uvula, your tongue plays an important role in many of these places. And then we'll talk through a lot of these. And again, there is a lot of vocabulary. There are a lot of terms, but we'll talk through them one by one. And we'll be using these frequently over and over again throughout the semester. So hopefully, even if it seems a little bit um, like a lot of information at the moment, as we continue practicing, as you have a chance to ask questions, it'll start setting in a little bit easier each time. So when we move into thinking of places of articulation, um, we'll start by talking about what those main three different uh, descriptions, different terms that we use to describe sounds and languages of the world. So the first one, the voicing, which we talked about in the last lecture, is what's happening in the larynx. Are we vibrating our vocal folds or are we not vibrating our vocal folds? And this is what gives us the voicing in sounds of languages of the world. The one we'll focus on today is place, so where the sound is made in the vocal tract and that'll be what we focus on in this lecture. And then the next lecture, we'll focus on the manner or how the sound is produced. And we'll dive a little deeper into um, what the how really refers to when we get there. But when we're talking about consonant sounds in languages of the world, these are the three terms that we're typically going to be using is voicing, place, and manner. So if we start by looking at specific places of articulation, we'll start with the front of the oral cavity and we'll move our way back through. Um, so we'll start with our lips and then we'll move back towards the back of our mouths. So if we start with the lips, the lips are an area that we use as a place for certain sounds of languages of the world. And English features several of these sounds as well. So again, we'll focus on English sounds as the ones that you should be familiar with, the ones that you should be aware of, the ones you can describe using these different descriptions. Is it voiced? Is it not voiced? What is the place? What is the manner? The English sounds of um, the places in the articulation are the ones that we're going to be focusing on. So when we look at lips, these are very common sounds in languages of the world. And we have several sounds in English that use the lips at least somewhat to some degree. So in English, sounds that we typically spell with things like P and B and M are P, B, M, W, F, V sounds, all use the lips in some way. And I can practice those in our synchronous class as well if it's hard to sort of picture that um, without the visual. And the sounds that are made using only our lips, we're using both our upper and lower lip, are what we call bilabial sounds. So bi meaning two, labial meaning lip. So even some of these terms that might seem a little bit um, difficult or there's a lot to remember, they're usually named after the place that they're talking about in some way that you can kind of link together. So when we press our lips completely together, um, we're making either a P or a B sound in English, or sometimes we're making an M sound. So there's going to be differences between them, even if we're doing the same kind of movement, we're using the same kind of place for all of them. So if you take a moment and think about, well, what is the difference between P and B? You can kind of make those sounds to yourself. P, B, P, B. And you may notice that we're making them exactly the same, but the difference is in the voicing. So with a P sound, if you stick your hand to your throat again, like we did in the previous example, P, you're not here you're not feeling a vibration but with b b b even before you're releasing that sound you're here you're feeling that vibration so p would be a voiceless sound b would be a voiced sound and they're both made with our lips they're both bilabial sounds and then m is also made at, as a bilabial sound we're also putting our lips together but what is different about m 
is that it's coming out of our nasal cavity. So we're closing our lips, but rather than open them to make the sound like with P or B, we're keeping our lips closed and we're letting the air flow through our noses instead. So it's flowing through our nasal cavity to give us that sound. So mm, the air is coming out of your nose as opposed to your mouth. And we can hear what these sound like in examples when we're just hearing Appa. a vowel before and after. Appa. So, P. Abba. Abba. Or we have our B sound. Amma. Amma. Or the M sound. M. And for each of those, if you test out making them, you'll notice that your lips are closed for each of those different sounds. <clears throat> Together, we're going to combine the use of our lips and our teeth. So the teeth are also an important um, place that we're using to make certain kinds of sounds. And when we combine the lips and the teeth together, these are sounds that are known as labiodental sounds. So labio meaning lip, dental meaning teeth. You combine those together to get labiodental sounds. And in English, it's our F and our V sounds that are labiodental sounds. And then together, if we use any of those sounds that are using our lips in any capacity, these are just broadly called labial sounds. And in the unit on phonology, we'll get into more about why labial sounds can be a useful distinction. For now, we'll focus on the individual places. So the labiodental sounds are F and our V sounds are the two that we have in English. And you may notice another similar kind of distinction between them. So, uh, fa. so, so fa. Uh, the. Va. Where the difference between them is again voicing. So F is voiceless, V is voiced. But they're made exactly the same. So you're not really moving your mouth. You're still keeping your places of articulation the same. The difference is if you're vibrating those vocal folds or not. And this brings us to the important aspect of what it means to think about articulation. We have different kinds of articulators that are happening when we're making any kind of sounds. And typically, a consonant sound will have what we call an active articulator and a passive articulator. So the active one is the one that's moving back and forth in order to create the sound. The passive articulator is the one that's staying put. It's not moving, but the other one is moving towards it. So in a sound like F or V, where we're using our lips and our teeth, you can think about which one is active and which one is passive. So if you're making an F sound, you may notice that it's your lip, your lower lip, that's moving up towards your teeth. Your, so in this case, your teeth would be the passive articulator. Your lips would be the active articulator. It's your lip that's moving. And this is because we can move our lower jaw up and down towards our teeth. We're not moving our entire head to our lip. It's our lip that's moving up and down and our teeth are staying in the same place. And for labial sounds, you're either using your, bo you're using your bottom lip as that articulator. So in a bilabial sound, you're opening and closing your mouth using your lower lip. With a labial dental sound, same thing. It's your lip that's moving back and forth. But for most sounds, and the ones that we'll see after this, it's the tongue that becomes the active articulator. And then the place we're describing would be the passive articulator. We're moving our tongue toward the different places that are the passive articulator to describe the place of articulation for the remainder of the sounds that we'll focus on um, in English. So if we move just a little further back and we're not focusing on our lips any longer, we're now moving to where the tongue is our active articulator, we get to the teeth as our next place. So sometimes the teeth are the passive articulators, both sets of our teeth, and these are known as interdental sounds. Um, so inter between dental teeth, so between the teeth. So the air is coming out through the, the space between your teeth in order to make these sounds. Sometimes you'll see them listed on charts and listed and described just as dental sounds. Dental sounds can be a little bit broader than interdental sounds. And in English, we do have interdental sounds. These are sounds that we typically think of as being spelled with a TH as examples of them. But it's really important to note, and we'll be covering this over the rest of this unit, that spelling in English is not going to be helpful for thinking about our sound system at all. Because even though we have one way to spell interdental sounds in English, our TH spelling, we actually have two different sounds that are interdental. So what you can test this with is if you say the, uh, th uh, the, the word thigh and compare that with saying the word 
thy. The difference between them, that first sound, the th or the sound, is again a distinction of voicing. So with thy, you have a voiceless one. With thy, you have a voiced one. And so even though we're producing them in the same place and the same way, their voicing distinction makes them sound uh, very different. So th, uh, th for the voiceless, th for the voiced. And we have lots of other examples in English for this as well. So the word north, for instance, ends in a voiceless sound. But if I add um, an ending to that and I say northern, that sound becomes voiced instead. Or the difference between taking a bath or if you are going to bathe someone, you have a th voiceless in bath and a th voiced in bathe. So there's lots of different examples where you might see similar words that are different just in that sound, similar to thigh and thy. We get to what's known as our alveolar ridge. So the alveolar ridge, if you look in the picture, is just a little bit behind your teeth. This is where your teeth go up into your gums. So it's the hard area that's just behind your teeth where the gums are. So if you want to reach in, you can kind of feel behind your teeth and you can feel that little gum area that kind of curves down towards where your teeth are. That would be the alveolar ridge. And when we put our tongue on that rigid area or near it in some way, depending on the kind of sound that we're going to make, these are known as alveolar sounds. So alveolar ridge is the place, so we call these alveolar sounds. These are some of the most common sounds in languages of the world. We have several of them in English as well, but we find them throughout the world in many different ways of making them. So the alveolar ridge is a very common place in order to make sounds. And many of our English sounds are produced at the alveolar ridge. Sounds like our t, our d, our s, our z, our n, our l, and our r sounds are also alveolar sounds. And these are many of them voiced. So we have some voice sounds, so d, z, n, o, er, are all voiced sounds. But we do have some voiceless sounds as well. So t and s are not voiced. So in this case, because we have so many different sounds happening at the alveolar ridge, the difference between these other sounds can't just be due to if they're voiced or if they're voiceless. So this is where that third factor comes in that we'll talk about in the next lecture. Where the difference between the rest of these sounds is due to the manner of articulation. How close are we getting to the alveolar ridge? What is the actual kind of restriction that's happening in our mouth? So I won't play each of them. These are all very common sounds in English. Our t, our d, our s, our z, n, o, er are all different examples of kinds of sounds that we make at the alveolar ridge. We also can move just a little bit further back behind the alveolar ridge where we're moving our tongue not right at the alveolar ridge, but kind of, and these are what we would call post-alveolar sounds. So post meaning back or after, so we're moving our tongue just a little bit further back from the alveolar ridge to make these sounds. And when we're placing our tongue in that spot between the alveolar ridge and our hard palate at the top of our mouths, we call these post-alveolar or alveopalatal sounds. The book, I believe, uses alveopalatal most frequently. They both refer to the same thing. You'll probably usually hear me say post-alveolar. It's a little bit easier to say, and it's a little bit easier to remember. And we do have a few examples of these in English as well. So again, spelling is going to be very difficult and it's not going to be reliable when we're trying to describe these sounds. So in the lectures for next week, we'll be looking at some of the um, ways that we can really talk about these sounds um, to separate them out from spelling. But sounds that we typically think of as our SH sounds would be an example of a post-alveolar sound. So you can see what's happening if you move from an S sound to a SH sound. So s, sh, 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 sh. And you may notice when you're making those two different sounds that they're made very similarly, but your tongue is moving just a little bit further back for that sh sound. It's curling up just a little bit, so maybe like a quarter of an inch. So it's a very small distinction, but it's giving us a completely different sound in English. And we do have a voiceless and a voiced version. The voiceless is much more common. We've had that historically in English. Uh, uh, ja. The voiced one is the sound that we borrowed from French, so we didn't always have the voiced version. But our sh sound, uh, sh sound sh, 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 
versus the voice version of that, which we do also have, uh, ja. have in several words in English. Ja, ja. And so this would be the difference in a word like mission versus a word like vision. So in both of those, the sound is in between two A sounds, but we have the voiceless one in mission and the voiced one in vision. So the zh, zh sound is an example of that voiced version. Now, as we move further back, we're through most of the place to the hard palate, which we would call palatal sounds. And we don't have very many sounds in English that are made at this place, but there are lots of sounds in other languages of the world that use the palatal place. And this is, is an important distinction between the other sounds we've talked about with our tongues so far. So before, when we're talking about dental sounds, postalveolar sounds, alveolar sounds, we're using the tip of our tongue as the active articulator, and we're moving it further back just a little bit more for each of those places that are further inside of our mouth. When we get to the hard palate, we're going to start switching and using a different aspect of our tongue. And so this is where we start using the base of our tongue in, as the active articulator. So it's really hard to curl your tongue so far back to get to those palatal places, but you can use your entire tongue to make palatal sounds. And so we have one of these sounds in English, and this is a sound that we often spell with the letter Y in a word like yellow or young. And again, this is deceiving because spelling is not actually going to help us with this, and it can be in very different um, examples, but that y sound is our example of a palatal sound. And you can feel the difference. So if you make a y sound, you should feel your entire tongue sort of moving up towards the hard palate and then dropping back down when you're finished. But it's not only in words that have that Y spelling. We have this in many others. So if we have the word that you see here, usual. The first sound in usual is also that Y sound. Our letter U, even just the way that we say the letter itself, has that Y sound in front of it. It starts with the consonant sound. But this isn't always the case with words that start with U or that have a U in them. So, uh, yeah. so if we have a word like uber or unusual, the U is pronounced in different ways and doesn't have that Y at the beginning. So when we're thinking about spelling and thinking about sound, you want to focus on the sounds you're hearing rather than what the spelling shows, because the kinds of sounds that we might have don't necessarily conform to our spelling conventions, especially in English. So if we move just a little bit further back, we're still using the base of our tongue, but we're moving further back in our mouth to make, we get to what's known as the soft palate or the velum. And by making sounds moving our, the base of our tongue towards the velum, we get what we call velar sounds. So these are sounds made by moving your tongue further back against the soft palate or the velum to get to those velar sounds. And we have a few of them in English, and we'll talk about those ones right now. So in English, the sound that we think of is our K sound, our K sound. And we can spell this in lots of different ways. So we can have it at the beginning with a K as in key. We can have it in the middle with a CK in a word like bucket, a KE in take, are all voiceless examples of a velar sound in English. So our K sound. You can feel your tongue sort of moving back k, 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 in order to make that sound. It's moving back toward the velum. Uh, and then we have a voiced version that's made exactly the same way as well. And this is our G sound, which is more commonly just spelled with a G. So in words like gas, agree, bag, these are all voiced versions of that same place of articulation where we have that g sound happening. Uh, happening. And then we have a third one here as well. So similar to our bilabial sounds where we had our p and our b, and then we had that m sound that was doing something different. In English, we also have a nasal sound, uh, 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 sound in the velum. And this is what we typically see or spelled as an NG sound, but it's not two different sounds like the spelling would suggest. It's just one single sound that we use two letters for. So in a word like sing, lung, we're not making a G sound at the end of that in most dialects. Sing, ng, ng, ng. It's just one single nasal sound that's happening, uh, happening there. Nga, nga. Though. So the velum is also where we're going to find that W sound that we talked a little bit about when we were looking at labial sounds. 
And this also involves the velum in addition to involving the lips. So our W sounds are actually a special kind of sound that we call a labiovelar sound because it involves both the lips and the velum. So it's a relatively special sound because it has two places of articulation. You need to move your lips into a rounded position and you're moving your tongue further back towards the velum at the exact same time to make that wah sound. So if you test it, you can feel your lips kind of pursing together and you can feel your tongue moving back at the same time. Let's see if we can hear this. Oh, uh, wah. And then in addition to the individual sounds that are made in the velum and that are these different velar sounds, the velum, uh, wow. velum is also what allows us to make any kind of nasal sounds. So this is responsible for allowing the airflow into the nasal cavity. You open up your velum and air can flow into your nasal cavity to produce any of these nasal sounds. So sounds like our m, mm, our n, mm, the alveolar one, and our n, mm, our velar sound are all nasal sounds where the air is able to go through your nasal cavity because your velum opens up to allow that air through. So it plays a really important role in several different sounds, not just the ones that are at the place of the velum. So those are all of the places that we have in English. We've now covered all of them. And at the front of our mouth, towards the back of our mouth, we have our bilabial sounds, things like p and b. We have our labiodental sounds, where we're using our lips and our teeth, so our f and v sounds. The interdental sounds, where we're sticking our tongue between our teeth in order to make that sound, so th or th. And then our alveolar sounds, moving just a little bit further back to where your tongue is at the alveolar ridge, so our t, our s, our z, o. Just a little further back from that would be those post-alveolar sounds like sh, our palatal sound y, and then our velar sounds like k and g. And then when we were talking about the voicing and we talked about the, the last lecture, what was happening in the subglottal region, those glottal sounds are also a place. So glottal sounds like that glottal stop in uh-oh, or our h sound, the glottal fricative, would also be a place. So the, that glottal place is the furthest back, but it's not really in the vocal tract itself. It's further down and further back. So those are all of the ones that we have in English. These are the ones you should be familiar with. These are the ones that you should study. It is a lot of terminology, but you can look at the diagram if that helps to really think about where these are taking place. I highly, highly suggest as we continue talking about these sounds that you practice making the sounds and thinking about where they're being made and how they're being made as you're practicing. So with a p and a b, you know these are bilabial sounds because you can feel your lips touching together as you're making those sounds. We will very briefly, before we end, talk about a few other places of articulation that we don't have in English, but that other languages of the world do have. So you'll notice that we have the velum as our furthest back in the oral cavity, but that there's a few other labels that you see further back in the mouth, things like the uvula and the pharynx are also areas that some languages make different sounds. So we don't have these in English, but they are common in some languages. And so if we move a little further back in the mouth, past the velum, we can get to sounds that are common in other languages that we don't have in English, such as uvular sounds. So the uvula, the thing that hangs down in the back of your throat, there are uvular sounds that are common in some Indo-European languages and also Native American languages. And we've borrowed, language, we've borrowed words from these languages and have to adapt them and put velar sounds in because we don't have uvular sounds. So the word kayak that we've borrowed, we are using a k, a velar sound, because it's the furthest back in our mouth, but it would sound more like a k, 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 k. It's like a K that, that's further back. You're moving your tongue even further back in your mouth to make that sound. Uh, ka. Ka, ka, ka. And then even further back, a little bit more into the upper areas of your throat would be pharyngeal sounds made at the pharynx just above your larynx. Uh, ka, uh, uh. And these are sounds that can be found that in languages like Arabic, Hebrew, um, other similar languages um, will have these pharyngeal sounds. Um, they're often described as guttural sounds. They're just further back into your upper throat when you're making them. So they can be hard to make if you're not familiar with them, if you're not used to making them as an English speaker. But these are found in languages um, like, uh -huh. like Arabic, like Hebrew. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh 
where you're sort of moving your throat back and forth rather than using your tongue because it's so far down that your tongue isn't really. And then finally, the one that we'll talk about that we find in many other languages that we don't see in most dialects of English are known as retroflex sounds. So we've talked about the difference between alveolar and postalveolar sounds using the tip of our tongue and then palatal sounds where we're using the base of our tongue. Retroflex sounds are placed further back on the palate, but rather than switching to using the base of your tongue like we do with our y sound, you're still using the tip of your tongue. You're just curving it back to reach the base of the hard palate. So it's almost like you're using the underside of the tip of your tongue in order to do that. And we find these most commonly in languages of India. Arda, arla. So languages like Hindi and Telugu and Tamil are languages where it's really common to find these sounds. So if you've ever heard someone speak with an Indian English accent, it's because they're using some of these sounds in place of some of the alveolar sounds that we would be using in our dialects of American English. And so you can kind of test it out by curling your tongue back Arda. to make it. Arda. So if you think about making a D sound, but then you curl your tongue back, Arda. or if you're thinking about making an Arla. R sound and curl your tongue back, Ra, ra, ra. It's going to be that curving, the curvature of that your tongue that's giving you that distinction in sound. So those are all of the ones that we'll cover for place in the next lecture. And in the meantime, any questions, don't forget, email me at cvanderstow at boisestate.edu. Schedule an office hours appointment. Um, listen to all of the lectures and bring any questions you have to synchronous class. We'll have a chance to really talk it through, answer questions, and discuss any of these sounds, practice using the sounds in as many ways as we can. We'll move on to that third part, manner, to be able to reach that area. If we think about them in from a... The velum does a few other things as well for sounds as that we have in English now. We get curling it just a little bit up so that it's just behind that alveolar ridge. If we move just a little bit further articulation and how we're making these different sounds, the next area is still going to involve the lips, but rather than having our upper and lower lip 